thought maybe I'd just start off with a little bit of the quiz, which you can answer and get a piece of chocolate with if you want to. So uh, if you're, this will show a little bit if you're listening. So uh, uh, what title did Zerubbabel have? Who was Zerubbabel? I, I, I. <laughs> kind of like Smuckers with a name like that. He has to be good, huh? Who was Zerubbabel? Nobody wants to even guess. You know I'm pretty generous with these things. <laughs> He was the governor of Judea, okay, the governor of Judea. And uh, this is something that is a little more maybe obscure, at least we didn't read it this morning. What was Zerubbabel known for? Uh-oh. What? <laughs> Now, there's a smart lady. I mean, she knows how to get her chocolate, huh? <laughs> well, there's a little, I don't know, there's a little little uh, child ditty that says, Zerubbabel built a temple pole, you know, so. He, well, the temple was destroyed in 586 with the Babylonians, and Zerubbabel was the main guy in charge of rebuilding it. And uh, where... In the Bible, do we find Haggai and Zechariah besides in the books that have their name? Which other book of the Bible is Haggai and Zechariah in? There's 66 books, and I've eliminated two, so you got a 1 in 64 chance of getting it. Yeah, any guess? Philippians. No, that's wrong, but I... <laughs> it's in the Old Testament. The book of Ezra, the book of Ezra. It's like, oh, <laughs> and who was Ezra while we're at it? Do I remember who Ezra was? Anybody that's been reading through the Bible this year? Who is Ezra? Got us another funny name. Sometimes I wish those guys had longer books because they're really important people, but uh, nobody seems to know who they are. Ezra is the... Uh, Reformer, he came back from uh, Babylon to Jerusalem, and uh, he, along with Nehemiah, built the walls. Nehemiah was mostly in charge of the walls. Nehemiah was the governor, but Ezra was the priest who began to teach the people again. So just some background again for Haggai. Judah was conquered in 586 B.C., and the survivors, many of those who survived, were taken to Babylon, quite a large number. And there they remained until Cyrus of Persia conquered uh, the Babylonian Empire. He conquered the city of Babylon in 539. And in the very next year, Cyrus issued a decree that allowed the Jews to go back home and, in fact, encouraged them to do so. I'd like to read his decree, at least the part that's listed in Ezra. Ezra chapter 1, here's what Cyrus, king of Persia, said. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Now, isn't that interesting? The emperor of the Persian Empire was given a command by God, and, and the emperor acknowledged that command. In fact, the emperor's name is found in Isaiah, and it's thought that he actually became a follower of the Lord, at least to some extent, after seeing his name prophesied in the holy books of the Jews. Anyway, the, his pr proclamation goes on. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so we see Cyrus providing Everything necessary for the temple, not just permission, not just the command, but even silver and gold and, and goods and, pro, and uh, commanding his people everywhere in the kingdom to help them so that this temple could be rebuilt, temple to the Lord. Many Jews did return and led by their governor uh, Zerubbabel and their high priest Joshua. They immediately set about rebuilding their lives, including their worship life, which, of course, was centered on the temple. And so the first thing they did just about was to um, build the altar 
The altar was outside the temple building itself. It was, you know, you don't burn fires inside a house, but uh, they had uh, uh, the altar outside and they, they built it and they began sacrificing on it almost right away. And then they started making plans to rebuild the temple itself. And of course, just the fact that they were already back in the land, their neighbors took notice. They took notice of the altar. They took notice of the fact that Jews were once again worshiping in Jerusalem. And the people that lived uh, in the former northern kingdom, who are now called Samaritans, they wanted to help rebuild the temple. And they came and asked if they could help. They said, after all, the Assyrian king that settled us here, well, we've been worshiping the God of this land ever since we've been here. Let us help build. But the Jews thought that their worship was impure. And you know how the Samaritans, you've heard the background of the Good Samaritan story, those people were unclean. They hated each other, big rivalry. And it already started back then. And there was no way the Jews were going to let the Samaritans and these other neighbors, the other pagan peoples around them, rebuild the temple. And so they refused all help. Well, you can guess what happened then. The Samaritans were upset. And they recruited their neighbors, and they all opposed the Jews, so much so that the Jews didn't get any further than laying the foundation, and they stopped. That's as far as they got. The temple never rose above ground level. Work stopped in 536. Only two years after they got back, there was nothing being done. And there the temple lay, nothing being done for 16 years, if you can imagine. Starting a building one that important even, and it laying there idle for 16 years. Well, after a while, the Cyrus, the king, died, and his son Cambyses didn't reign very long before he died, and Darius ascended the throne in 522. So we fast-forwarded a few years, and shortly thereafter, in 520, Haggai and Zechariah began to prophesy with the intent of spurring the people into action to rebuild the temple. And the people hadn't been completely idle. They put all their energy into their homes and in their farms. They worked to rebuild their towns. And yet, as the lesson goes, as the reading uh, read, they had little success. They weren't prospering at all. They were still a poor, scattered people back in the land. And according to the book of Haggai, uh, the Lord identified th for them why they were not having any success. In chapter 1, verse 9, it's because they had neglected God's temple. You expected much, but it turned out to be little. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Literally, the Lord said, each of you is running to his own house. And so we get the idea that they were so enthralled, so involved in their own lives, their own things, that they had forgotten those things of the Lord. In verse 4, the people had been saying, it is not yet time for the Lord's house to be built, but in return the Lord asked them, is it time for you to be living in paneled house while my house remains a ruin? But Haggai came then, and with these and other words, pointing out that the Lord's house was in ruins, pointing out that it was up to them to go up into the hills and bring down the wood to finish the temple, to work on that temple, the temple of stones and wood, and finish the process they had started so many years ago. And the people led by the good example of Zerubbabel and Joshua, listened to the voice of the Lord through Haggai and through Zechariah. And they were further encouraged by other messages. Haggai has four messages in his short little book. And Zechariah, if you read through that, has a series of eight visions, all of which are uh, intended to inspire the people to work, to complete the temple, because God's glory will be there. The Lord said in, uh, Isaiah, in Haggai's second message, I am with you. What a great promise that is. And it's not just for the future, it's I am with you. I'm here with you now. 
And think what that meant to the, to the exiles who had returned. They felt like God had abandoned them. They felt like living in Babylon, they weren't even close to God anymore. And God said, I am with you. God had left the temple. Ezekiel prophesied so vividly how he had seen the presence of God depart from Jerusalem. And now God said, I am with you. As Christians, you know, we, we regard the promise of God to be so precious, and particularly at the Great Commission, which Jesus ended, behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And how we hold on to that because when God is with us, who can be against us? When God is with us, how can we fail? And so it was with those people as well. With God being in their presence, in their midst, they could proceed without fear, in spite of opposition to rebuild the temple. And the next message in chapter 2 Haggai said, the glory of the present temple shall exceed the glory of the former one. Now, the first temple was the temple built by Solomon, very rich and wealthy, very extravagant temple, one of the wonders of the world. They didn't have those kinds of resources. Yeah, Cyrus had promised them they, they could have what they needed, but it wasn't like Solomon rebuilding the temple all full of gold and silver. In Haggai chapter 2, speaking of the foundation, but it was true of the temple as well, in verse 3, ask them, who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? And yet the Lord promised that the glory of that house would be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. That would, too, inspire them on, inspire them to greater things, to work with all their hearts, to put everything of their lives into the Lord's work. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But then the Lord promised further on in chapter 2, from this day on I will bless you. When the Lord saw how hard they worked, how they were once again pouring themselves into the work of God, pouring themselves into building that temple, in obeying the voice of the Lord. The Lord said, from now on, I will bless you. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But going back to that promise in the third message, the glory of this present temple will be greater than the glory of the former. There was no way the people could see that. A plain building surpassing the glory of Solomon. And the Lord even dwelt, you remember that pillar of fire and pillar of cloud that accompanied Israel in the desert? It was there in Solomon's temple too. We read in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles when the temple opened, fire came from heaven and consumed the sacrifices and the Lord dwelt in the temple. And this poor little building, almost the same size, but far, far more plain, how could they see that the glory of that temple would surpass Solomon's. But later on, in the time, almost when it was time for Jesus to be born, Herod the Great took the throne, and he rebuilt the temple. He hadn't been destroyed again, but he wanted to make it of greater glory yet, and he poured all of his wealth, great wealth, into that temple. Wealth that he got as a ruler in the Roman Empire. And it was regarded as the greatest and most beautiful building in the whole Roman Empire, the wonder of the world once again. And the wealth of the nations did indeed flow into that temple, into Herod's temple. And yet there was an even greater fulfillment of Haggai's promise. When the Jewish leaders asked Jesus for a sign, Jesus said, destroy this temple the temple, that beautiful temple, the wonder of the world that 
Herod had built, Jesus was standing within that temple and he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But the Bible informs us that the temple Jesus spoke of was his body. Jesus' body was indeed destroyed by those very same Jewish leaders as they arrested him on trumped up charges. Had him crucified, tortured and died on the cross of Calvary. But he died on the cross to take away the sins of the world, our sins, my sins, everyone's sins. He was buried, and, but the tomb couldn't hold him. He rose again from the dead on the third day to bring forgiveness of sins and eternal life to all who come to him. And this then really brought to fulfillment the prophecy of Haggai. The glory of the present temple will surpass the glory of the former one. For not only was God dwelling in the temple, but God in the person of Jesus became the temple. He was the temple. He is our temple, the temple of the Lord. A message which will continue through all eternity. A reality, in fact. Revelations talks about there will be no temple there for the Lord is its temple in the new Jerusalem. And that began when Jesus rose from the dead. He became the eternal and living temple of God, which will never be destroyed. A living temple to which any and all believers may now enter and abide, dwell in, live in forever. And it's further fulfilled, Haggai's prophecy is fulfilled that the greater glory will be in that last temple that we who trust in Christ are part of his temple. We're not just in the temple, we're part of it. A great truth in the New Testament, which should give us all cause of celebration. And I'd like to read just a few scriptures from Romans chapter 12, is the first one, Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And we think of this passage, and it's true, it's a passage about spiritual gifts, but it's also about how we are part of Christ's body. We're not just a piece of clothes he puts on to use that. We are part of him. Baptized into Christ, we become one with Christ. We are his body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, Ephesians chapter 4. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And that's how important we are to God, that Christ is the head, but we are the body. He can't live without us, we, nor can we live without him. We're that closely intertwined because he loves us and died for us to include us in his body. In Colossians 1, verse 18, And Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Christ is the head, and we are the body. And so when Christ spoke of himself, his body as the temple of the Lord. We can be included in that. Haggai was talking about going and rebuilding the Lord's house, the Lord's temple, and we have that fi uh, figure in the New Testament as well. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. 
And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We're part of the building, part of the temple that God lives in. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? And here the you is plural. He's speaking to the church. But in chapter 6, verse 19, do you not know that your body, singular you, each person, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So again, we are his temple. And Peter, in his first letter, using even more picturesque language, more construction type language if you will says this as you come to him the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ and he goes on to talk about Christ the precious stone and later on says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are Christ's body. We are his temple, one with him because of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. When Francis was praying in the rundown church of San Damiano, the Christ on the crucifix spoke to him and said, go rebuild my church, which as you can see, it's in ruins. And so Francis did that, literally getting stones, begging stones, getting people to help him. And he rebuilt that church and two others. But he eventually came to see the greater meaning and the greater message that the Lord had for him was to build up God's people. That's the real church. The real church is us, redeemed by God. Other living stones built into Christ, into the living temple of God. So also is our calling as Francis to build up the church of God. The Great Commission, which is making disciples, is nothing else but building that house of God, enlarging the rooms, putting on the roof, furnishing it with many features, when we bring other people in and teach them to obey everything the Lord has commanded us, we too are building God's church. Are you part of that house? Are you a member of Christ's body? That's the only path to immortality and eternal joy. We all have bad days. We can all sing the blues, but it's not a good place to stay. When we realize that Christ died for us and ask him into our hearts, we are his body. We are part of him. And joy, we can't help but have that joy. We can't help but be filled with peace and with the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. God's house is the only house that endures forever. We need to make sure we're part of that. And once we're part of that house, to radiate the warmth, the splendor, the goodness of that place to others. Be that living stone that calls out to others to join others, join in the joy of their master and savior who died for them. And so may our lives, our giving, our worship, may everything we say and do and think be all for God's glory, that we too may rebuild his house. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our next hymn. Jesus paid it all, number 407.